So we have different panels throughout the week that are just bringing rock stars in the space and people that are complete visionaries. My name is Ken Rakowski. I'm hosting the next two conversations, which are all around where food security is, how we get technology to really help the adva advancement when it comes to nutrition and security. And I'm really excited to talk about that. But before I want to do that, I wanted to, who's here, who got a, who, uh, who's out of the office today? Who like was able to get out to come to Golf Food? You got out of the office, right? You got out of the office. Who had to travel to get here from another part of the world? Wow, where'd you come from? Right back there, where? Guatemala. Guatemala, wow, Guatemala, I've been to Tikal, very cool. Where'd you come from? Lebanon. You? Lebanon, very cool. Where'd you come from? New York City, New York City NYC, who else? India, Pakistan, you guys are sitting together, it looks good, I like it. <laughs> Weird border, but it looks great. Um, I want you to take a, a note and just think about something right now. You're all really busy, but you're here. This is a summit. And what I mean by that is, I climb a lot. And when I get to the top of a mountain or top of a big hill, I stop and I look around. And I really take in what's happening. See, most of the time when people summit, they go, all right, how am I going to get down? How am I going to get back there? And often when we come to these events, you're summiting. You're on the top. You're here. It may have taken you months. Some of you may, maybe even years to get here. Appreciate where you're at. So when a speaker says, hey, I'm going to be in the corner. Come and meet me. Do it. Take pictures. Come over on the stage and take pictures. Summit and enjoy the summit. Because this doesn't happen all the time, and it really doesn't. So take the time and appreciate what you're doing, because you're summoning right now. So I want to bring up our next panel. Hey, guys, you guys all ready? Dennis, Sky, are we all here? So let's bring up our panel. I'm very excited about this next panel. Actually, where's Sky? Is Sky here? He's come. It's like a rock star type of thing, right? Come on, take a seat. Let's go sit down. Come on up, Dennis. I know Sky will join us in a moment. Let's uh, sit underneath your pictures, I guess, is what we got to do. Yeah, you're right there, right? Is that your picture, Dennis? Is that your picture, Alexander? Yeah, you go. And then Sky's going to sit there. Whenever Sky pops up there, before Sky gets up here. Hi, guys. Hi, kid. This is a. I've been so excited. I've been so excited about this panel. We uh, we. By the way, before every panel we had a panel discussion on Zoom. So every panel that you've seen here, those moderators have spent time with the panelists. So I've done, I think, 15 different Zoom calls. And this is the one I had the most fun with. Because we talked a little about what the panel discussion was. We talked more about family and time and places to travel to, which I really, if you can, you're, you're living in Oman right now. Uh, I don't live in Oman, but I was stuck in Oman during COVID and became a big fan of it, and it's my favorite country. But I called you for you were in Oman, I believe. I was in Oman at the time. Yeah, I just right. I just came from Muscat. So if you had to be the uh, the tourism department for Oman right now, what would you tell people about Oman that they may not be aware of? Why it's magical? To me, Oman is the California of the Middle East. You've got mountains. You've got diverse agriculture methods. You've got kind people, nice traditions. And it's a really wonderful, accepting, and beautiful country. It welcomed me in as a refugee during COVID, and I just can't wait to go back. Wow. And it's green. Oh, it's green. I mean, you go to the Green Mountain, and you can see cascading terraced agriculture. In the summertime, the temperature will be 10 to 15 degrees Celsius lower than it is on the coast. So it's very relieving in the hot summers of the region. You go to the south, you can see waterfalls and tropical agriculture. So really, there's all kinds of things. It's incredibly diverse and beautiful. I love that you said diverse in agriculture, green. You're saying all the buzzwords. Tell us what you do. I'm Henry Gordon Smith. I'm the founder and CEO of Agritecture. And we're really on a mission to help empower and accelerate the transition to smarter and more resilient agricultural systems. And so we do that by providing consulting services all around the world. So far, 150 clients in 35 countries. And those range from feasibility studies to due diligence for investors to local food system planning for policymakers. 
you name it, we're here to provide services to really help move into the sector and the sustainability that we're all looking for. And the vast majority of our projects relate to controlled environment agriculture, greenhouses and vertical farms. And we've designed some of the big projects around the world as well as been behind the scenes. We also have a software that we built recently called Agriculture Designer, which does the same thing our consulting does, but at a much lower cost. And we're on a mission to really democratize the basic data you would need to understand yields, capex, opex of any greenhouse or vertical farm by doing it online on our platform. It's a pleasure to be here. Awesome. Alexander, you've been bouncing around the country, about around the planet, right? Where are you where are you positioned right now? Where is your base? So we're based here in Dubai. Um, we set up Greener Crop. Uh, two years ago, in the middle of COVID. And you have a, a, an Emirati accent. So an Emirati accent, here. no. Not at all. Where are you from originally? I'm originally German. And, and, and why here? Why Dubai? So I've been here for the last uh, 10 years. I was in charge of Groupon, Rocket Internet, and Delivery Hero. So I was working very heavily in the tech space. And then the last two years before starting Greener Crop, I was more on the tech investment side of things. And that's when you know, we started exploring the opportunity of investing into ag tech. And at that point, you know, that's when I kind of came across the opportunity where we realized that despite a clear demand in this region for locally grown produce and the availability of technology like hydroponic farming, aeroponic farming, et cetera, that the technology is not being deployed at a meaningful scale yet. Um, this is obviously, you know, at the cusp of pure harvest launching and, you know, these first big farms coming to the country, but we're still a long way away from really reaching saturation or food security. Um, as outlined in the, in the strategic vision of the UAE. And so the focus of Greener Crop really is to enable hydroponic farmers. And we try and do that by combining, you know, by, by providing clients with a combination of cutting edge technology as well as operational excellence and data driven farm management. So we're a farm management company. Clients come to us with the aim of setting up a farm. For most of them, it's a non-core part of their business that they want to expand into, and we provide them with the resources, the technology, the know-how to operate high-yielding and profitable farms. Awesome. Sky, I see you every single day. I do. I see Pure Harvest everywhere I go. You, you just, this territory you own, it really, it's pretty amazing. It really is. Because you've been around for how long? Uh, just under five years now. And in five years, it's hard not to find you. Well, thank you. And apologies I'm late, everybody. I was stuck with one of my bosses, an investor outside. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the uh, lost track of time. Um, yeah, so we started about five years ago. We obviously design, build, and operate very high-tech, climate-controlled, what we call hybrid growing systems, sort of like a vertical farm in a greenhouse had a baby. And um, as you mentioned, we've been around for a while. We've, we have three operating farms in the UAE doing strawberries, leafy greens, and tomatoes, growing over 50 varieties of crops now. And uh, we also built our first farm in Saudi Arabia, which launches, the product hits the market at over 130 tons a week of production beginning in March. Um, and we're partnered with Nadek, the large dairy company there, and, and a 30 megawatt solar power farm that powers that farm and its, its energy needs for its climate management system. So we're doing a lot of interesting and innovative stuff at significant scale. We've raised a lot of capital in the region. We've been beneficiaries of, of essentially leading and now riding this wave of the adoption of controlled environment ag in the region and people's understanding and, and, and really acknowledging the need to have local production that is sustainable, providing food security, water conservation, economic diversification, and sustainability. And now we're expanding in Asia, as I think you're aware. We're, uh, we're gonna be building in Southeast Asia in the year, this year. And uh, an, an investment banking background, finance background? Yeah, so I actually started, not, like, not unlike uh, Dennis Levine here, we used to uh, be, be uh, you know, in New York, and started in banking, then private equity. I call myself a uh, recovering investor. And um, so I, I was actually, at, uh, it's interesting, I was on the other side of the table evaluating companies and looking for opportunities for many years, but I had just a, an itch and a desire to build something and to be part of something impactful. And I recently read a study actually from Stanford, I think it's interesting if everyone reads this, but there, there was a study about no matter how rich you get, it doesn't give you purpose. And it's this fantastic data that supports the importance of purpose and giving someone a meaningful life. And I think at the time I was saying, I have a great investment career, but I want to go do something and have an impact with my talents and mm -hmm. my time on this planet. And I feel Pure Harvest does that. It's quite fulfilling work. Absolutely. Actually, that's where we first met was at Stanford yes. 10 years yes, ago. Yes, it was. So it's just ironic. And then Dennis. Dennis, uh, I, I know you didn't like me saying you're a uh, Wall Street guy, but you really, your, your roots are Wall Street. So you look at not just where the purpose is, but the profit's important too. Don't be afraid, just admit it. I'm not afraid, Ken. <laughs> <laughs> it's one thing to grow food, it's another thing to grow profits. Yeah. Uh, 
Let me start by saying what a privilege it is to be here with this panel, because it's rare to find four like-minded people who share this vision of the future of agriculture, the agricultural revolution that we're all participating in. Not only is there a food renaissance going on out there, but to your point, Ken, there's a capital renaissance. We see billions and billions of dollars flowing into the ESG impact space. And all of that money is looking for a home. So when you think about what all of us are doing here, uh, and just what, for example, what Sky is doing here, we're doing in the United States. We're building large scale, hybrid, smart farms to produce food closer to where people live. Because even in my country, which is the salad basket of the world, and where most of the stuff is grown in California and shipped, it has a very high carbon footprint, long food miles, and we can eliminate all that through technology. And in a world that is resource starved with population growth and climate change, we all need to find much better ways to produce food efficiently and sustainable. So this is the most wonderful, wonderful group of people to collaborate with and help change the world. All of us have to do that. Absolutely. So data, 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 really important. Because when you look at data, you can kind of predict what the future is by utilizing historical information, right? Has the data shown something that shocks you lately, or is it just seems to be pretty consistent, Henry? Yeah, data can be very helpful um, in a number of areas to operate properly or to plan properly. A lot of what we do is about planning, so we're really interested in running scenarios for how something will perform effectively, because we think that we need to get more of these farms built. I think we agree on that. But we also need to have the baseline understanding for that. But bad data can be really terrible. And one of the problems in our sector is there's a lot of bad data out there. There's a lot of data that's going to investors, a lot of data that's being promoted about impact or sustainability that's just simply not accurate. So we're sort of trying to balance that out by creating access to data on the basics. So when I started 10 years ago in this sector, I could not get the yield information for a greenhouse or vertical farm. You have to dig through academic papers, compare this scale to that scale, a research facility versus a commercial facility. Farmers often have difficulty talking about it themselves and accessing it and sharing it, especially 10 years ago. So I really went on this journey to gather that as much as possible and to create a methodology for how you can act on that data. And again, that's what we're trying to do now with our software, is trying to say, you know, no more of this BS. Let's just create a place where you can get the yield data for any greenhouse or vertical farm across 75 most popular crops. Because investors, policymakers, and entrepreneurs are all repeating the same mistakes of the past because they have bad data when they're making planning decisions. And right now, the data that you have, uh, how do you know it's bad data versus good data, even today? Our data? Well, I think that our data comes from a variety of sources, including operational data itself, academic institutions that we've worked with. We have an advisory board that reviews the data as well. We have three main sources. So we have operational data, we have observed data, and then we have theoretical, which is based on models that we create based on our expertise. All of those are built into underlying models in the software, and you can access them, and they vary depending on scale and how that might change certain performance aspects like climate control. So, Alexander, yesterday, or the last couple of days, many of the panels have talked about how this pendulum is going back and forth. First, it was all around sustainability. Then, during COVID, it went to food security. And now it's kind of going right back to sustainability. Are you seeing the same thing? I think not so much here in the UAE. I think the focus still is very heavily on food security. Um, sustainability is, is one of these concepts that's a little bit hard to explain because of all the, the variations that factor into this. Um, you know, we, we get asked quite, a, quite frequently whether hydroponic produce is considered organic here. Um, and it's, it's not, for the record. Um, I think there's an effort in the government to change it. The USDA over in the US has already changed the definition to make sure that hydroponic farming is organic. We're expecting that to happen here anytime now. But, you know, what's more important is what does organic actually mean? And what are you missing out on if you don't purchase organic? So, you know, if we talk about sustainability and we talk about food security, I think that those two concepts go hand in hand because um, it's unsustainable to be dependent on imports. It's unsustainable for 80% of our produce to be imported from, you know, 5,000 plus miles away. So, organic doesn't help us too much if that's, you know, applied to organic avocados coming out of Peru. Right, an avocado that has to travel 15,000 miles to be here is not sustainable, cannot be sustainable. From Guatemala. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's your fault. Um, and so, 
you know, we need to make sure that we do our education on that without overwhelming the clients. We need to make sure that they understand what hydroponic farming really means and what the benefits of it are, health-wise, nutrition-wise, but also the impact on the environment. And so, fortunately, we don't have to choose to promote either or. I think we still have a long way to go in educating the clients about just the benefits of this technology that to a lot of our clients is still fairly new. Got it. Sky, I'm going to put you on the spot. You, uh, it's, it's been written that you are kind of like the darling of this space. You've done some pretty serious capital raises out here. What is public? How much has Pure Harvest publicly raised? Uh, publicly, uh, over $280 million. $280 million. Okay, it's pretty, it's amazing, right? It's I'm been, guessing... It's been a lot of work. <laughs> I'm guessing you have become the pitch master. I, I, yeah, I guess so. I mean, I, I think I'm, I'm unfortunately burdened by this desire to tell the truth, and I find that a bit hard uh, because we, we've joked about this before, but um, I, we, I, I put out this uh, piece called, about veridical farming, and veridical means truthful. And it was a bit of an attack on my own industry because, as I, I think uh, Henry Gordon Smith here just mentioned earlier, there's some real bad data out there where people are communicating lofty ambitions. And, you know, 10 years from now, when LEDs are at this and my cost structure is that and water's available somehow, I'm, my, my, uh, I'll have 100 times the output of a field and this and that. And, and then people buy it, the press feeds it to everybody. And then, interestingly, it's the benchmark that an investor comes to the table with in their head saying, why do you use more water than this data? And, uh, and it's frustrating. So I would say, yes, I have become very good at telling our story. Um, and also, I think I've started to understand what makes the story resonate to others. So something, uh, something over the last two years we've been talking about ourselves as in this region, for instance, where I found it difficult to communicate why agriculture could have a comparative advantage producing here, right? So I started to communicate ourselves as an energy company, because we really are an energy company. We take sun energy, through the chemical process of photosynthesis, sun, CO2, water, and nutrients, we create plant matter. So I said sun and CO2 are abundant in the Middle East. That becomes intuitive why it could be affordable to produce food in the Middle East, right? So I have changed how I tell the pitch and the, and the story to align to what people understand and can relate to, to believe in it. Yeah, I like that. Going back to the Wall Street guy, Dennis Levine. Dennis, organics, you're an organics it's kind of crazy to think from Wall Street to organics. How do you define that story when you're talking to investors going, this is why it's so important to look at a for-purpose but very much for-profit opportunity? I don't think the two are mutually exclusive. I think like any business, and we're all in this business, you look at all the inputs, and as Sky just said, you look to reduce the input costs. So you have an abundance of sun, you have different ways to produce. You lower your energy cost. You get your food to market sooner because you're not importing it from Guatemala or any place else. You, you're already halfway through it. Then if you can figure out the proper operating metrics, which is kind of the data I focus on, how do you make money? What's your top line? What's the point of sale? Look at what the products cost in the market today. Then work backwards and say, how do I reduce my inputs? without reducing the quality, and in fact, enhancing the quality along the way, so I can bring a superior product to market in a timely basis that has higher nutritional value and a longer shelf life. To your point, we, we already got a USDA organic certification in our previous operation in the United States, which I will confess was a Herculean task. It didn't happen overnight. A lot of inspections, a lot of challenges, but a very bright engineering and design team, which is so important in this process, if you're going to design, build, distribute, and sell your product, it's fundamentally important to keep your cost down and your efficiency high. So guys, which one's broken more? Is it the supply chain of getting food from one point to another? Is it the actual nutritional value of the food? Okay, look at <laughs> The nutritional value of the food, or is it the education of the actual consumer? If you want, yeah, I think I, I, maybe I'll go first. I think it depends where you are in the world. Okay. Um, I think in the United States, for instance, there's a lot about the consumer and what they choose, as well as the nutritional value of the food. Supply chains are actually well established. What players like yourself are trying to do is disrupt that supply chain and produce locally, use technology to lots of benefits. But I think in other parts of the world, um, the Middle East, where you know over 80% of our fresh produce is imported, the supply chain is a major challenge. And you saw that with COVID. When, when people forget that humans subsidize food, 
because when we're flying those airplanes, the belly has cargo. And when there's no people flying in planes, the cargo prices rise dramatically and it becomes a, an impediment to distributing food, especially fresh, right? Anything that perishes within 14 days and has a limited shelf life becomes extremely vulnerable to supply shocks. And so supply chains become a major problem. And it's why you see the food security response and people don't forget. Another example is, I mean, look at Qatar. There was a different reason why there was an incredible supply shock, right? So I think it depends where you're in the world. Markets like India, where there's something like 30 to 35% of the fresh produce ends up wasted. And it, because the, the buyer, the supplier cannot find the market and or intermediaries are causing all kinds of frictional challenges and mafia-like behavior. Um, and, and these types of things happen. So it really depends where you are in the world. But in the emerging markets that we operate in, I think I would have to say supply chain, then consumer, then uh, nutrition. Because nutrition is a bit of a luxury. People are after just getting fed, right, which is the first priority. You're agreeing with everything. I mean, I, I, I definitely agree that it depends on the region. I think, like, I want to avoid simplifying the food system and the challenges we have because they're extremely complex and they're very regional. I also think that just inequality is a huge issue related to food. You know, you look in New York City and one in four children go hungry. In New York City, one of the richest places in the world, they get their food, they get their nutrition from going to school. Globally, we produce enough food to feed everyone. So I think the supply chain issue is very important. We just don't distribute it properly. There's not enough access to it properly. And the kind of food system we live in versus what people in Africa or developing countries live in is extremely different. The percentage of our income that we spend on food is dramatically less than the percent of their income that they spend on food to sustain themselves. So it's filled with paradoxes and complexity. But I do think that the consumer piece is also very important, especially in the developed world. If we're looking in this context, we need to understand that when we are buying something, especially food, we're voting. We're saying, this is what I want. I care about processed. I care about plastic packaging. I care about whatever the branding that is on it. And we have that power to drive the market in a capitalist system. If I could add one comment, and it just is a powerful illustration of this supply chain. When supply chains are conquered, the food, food can be incredibly low cost and available. And I want to give an example. I grew up in a lower socioeconomic family. My father used to, we used to often buy uh, these uh, Burger King Whoppers. The 99 cents, you couldn't possibly construct a meal that was actually you know, fully healthy for you for that cost. Yet, look at that burger, you know, perfectly consistent. It had and, you know, cow, cow meat and maybe some other things. And then it had, uh, it had tomatoes, lettuce, mayonnaise, bread, all for 99 cents. Have it you couldn't way. possibly construct that, have it your way. No, but it's, it's a, it is an example of a company that conquered the supply chain, right? They're vertically integrated, they have incredible efficiency. That's just an, a microcosm of what's happening when the, con when the supply chains and the supply side can be conquered. And then you have the demand and the waste and other things to tackle and what people choose to eat. But in that an example where choice is not uh, uh, abundant, uh, the supply chain makes food affordable. And uh, that alone is a powerful example of what's possible if we conquer the supply side issues. It, it's, it's, it's so spot on. But when you, look at the, you look, when you look at the point of sale and you work your way back to the produce manager in the store, so you, you would sell to Carrefour, for example. That produce manager every day wakes up saying, where am I getting my produce from today? Am I going to the Dubai market? Or am I going to Sky's operation at Pure Harvest? Knowing you have a consistent local source of supply that is predictable because it has no weather-related crop failure just like we have in the United States, and that you can supply it on a 24-hour basis, we call this agrifacturing. It's consistent. It works. You get the phone call. But it's like he an knows arbitrage. You'll be there. It's a constant arbitrage, it sounds like. Because no matter what country you're in, there will be a weather-related crop failure. There will be a transportation failure. There will be a pandemic. Something will disrupt the supply chain. California's had fires, we've had floods, and we've had droughts. And where 90% of the food is grown, that's, it's an imperative to find an alternative in a world, to your point, where the population is growing, the temperatures are rising, and we're running out of water and arable land. So a billion people go to sleep on this planet malnourished, and a child dies of hunger every five seconds today. That will only get worse unless people like us with access to capital can revolutionize this industry and make change. That's why we're all here today. I was shocked to read what happened 50 years ago. No one ever talks about it. Is when it, before it was in Bob, it was called Rhodesia, and it was the breadbasket of Africa. And it brought all of this nutrition to parts of Africa. And then when it became Zimbabwe and Mugabe got involved and went after the farmers and all that, and all that just disappeared, how much uh, 
I would just say hunger and starvation happen in Africa because of that, which is very similar to when these uh, issues happen in Southern California. It affects short term. This is a long term situation because again, back to food security, because we don't take conflict into this. Because conflict is another factor that has to be put inside food security. Do you agree? I mean, absolutely. I mean, you can look at Russia during the Soviet Union, you can look at China as well. It's not just conflict, it's the political leadership and different strategies and political decisions that can go wrong, that can create mass starvation. Um, it's, it's extremely difficult to manage agriculture properly at scale. Yeah. Alexander, you want to say something earlier? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the point is we're looking at this from a very macroeconomic point of view, right? And, you know, on the, if, if we zoom in, obviously, you know, for an individual farmer, the, the question is always going to be, Turning a profit means I'm able to sell the produce I'm growing at a price that I will be able to make profit at. And that depends on whether client is willing to pay the amount that you want. Right? And that, in, in, in an individual farmer's case, is not really dependent on what he would like to sell it at. Right? I mean, if we could sell our produce at whatever price we want to sell that, we'd all be billionaires. Um, but instead, you know, it's going to be dictated by the wholesalers, it's going to be dictated by the, real, uh, by the real retailers, it's going to be dictated by your own B2C channels. And so it's important that, you know, we, we, we set a good example for this, that, you know, what Henry said about the data, that we make sure that our farmers have access to the right data to make the right decisions. Because one of the big challenges, obviously, for all of these farmers is that there is, there are a large number of manufacturers that produce different types of technology. There's the influence from the media, like Sky mentioned, where we're looking at, you know, this concept of urban farming. Um, Sky does not do urban farming. Pure Harvest does not do urban farming. And they're without doubt, you know, the most successful alternative advanced farming system in, in the Middle East, right? But yet the majority of our clients come to us and look for a, a, um, a vertical farm that they want to set up in an urban location. And we're not going to solve food security. We're not going to basically democratize the process of, of hydroponic and alternative farming by luring them into this belief that if you can set up a very expensive farm with very expensive LEDs and you're going to be growing very premium produce, they are going to solve anything in the, in the market. I know, but that's right. part of the educational side. You know, there's a, a mutual friend of Dennis and I, Eric Oberholzer, who owns uh, Tender Greens out of uh, Los Angeles and New York. And his goal is to be completely sustainable when it comes to his, his vegetables, where he's going to grow all of his leafy stuff, everything on his own inside. And that's inside New York. I think you've even yeah. seen some of his locations, right? Yeah. Yes. Been there. So You've been, been there, right? Yeah, so, so, I mean, that right there. And then he educates the consumers. They come in why this is important. That's where we have to take it. But where I wanted to go with this is, are you farms of the future? Is that what you are? Or are you the, the farm of what today is? Oh, I, I think both. I think we are definitely the farms of today. Uh, you've certainly demonstrated that here. And I think this tidal wave will only grow in the years ahead as people become more cognizant of it. And to, you, and to your point, which is also right on, you know what a product costs in the store. So if you're selling a product at retail for $2, and it costs you $4 to produce it, chances are you have an unsustainable business model. So it's critically important to work from that point of sale backwards to see if you can, in fact, produce that product and allow the farmer, or in our case, more industrial scale farms indoors, to earn a profit. And those are the kind of operating metrics that will attract significant amounts of capital. Pure Harvest has demonstrated that and grow this business on a global level. I was really surprised our last speaker, Ben, he was saying his restaurants are doing 35% EBITDA. That's a pretty impressive number for a restaurant, right? And I'm wondering, can you see the same type of numbers on your side? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it just goes exactly what, but yes, facility, facility level um, margins can exceed that. That's okay. correct. You guys say it with, they have it with a smile on their face, which means it's much higher than that. Well, it's like growing money. <laughs> well, actually, what I wanted to comment on, though, is what you said. I, uh, when we were talking about scaling down farming, I think there are some dangers in, in kind of the allure of these business models. Because it's a question of which problem do you want to tackle? Do you want to give better nutrient-dense microgreens to, you know, wealthy individuals in Brooklyn? Or do you want to feed people, right? Because the solution that might do the first and be really interesting and draw attention grown in sideways in a, in a vertical tower with robots in Manhattan 
is very different from the one that will feed 70% of humanity, right? And I believe, so when you ask if we're the farm of the future, I believe we are. And I think it's because I'm, I'm poisoned with pragmatism and in the same way you are. Yep. I care that the unit cost makes sense. I care that my customer and my consumer both capture economic rents when we produce food. And how do we do that? We innovate on three pillars, and I'm happy to share this. One, we call it the box, but essentially how do we make our farm more efficient? And how we measure that is what we call light efficiency. The joules of energy converted into kilograms of plant matter, the ultimate measure of yield. Because we, can't, we can make more light with artificial light, but that's more investment and more energy and carbon and blah, blah, blah. So what we do is say, God-given light, how much output? And then that's what we're focused on in the innovations there. Then we innovate on how we integrate with other infrastructure. We partnered with Nadek in Saudi Arabia, not only because they have a wonderful consumer brand and huge reach, but they had a 30 megawatt solar power farm. They philosophically embraced the need for sustainable energy to get off the grid, which was rising in price and heavy fuel oil is rising in Saudi Arabia. And we said, if energy prices rise, my cost structure goes upside down because we use a lot of energy to control climate. So we married somebody who already had an at scale solar farm that lets us have a power price half of that of the grid. It was good for my cost structure and good for the world and the consumer, right? And now we're doing partnerships like that with geothermal power and other assets around the world. And then on the last point of innovation, I think this is an important one, and it's why I've, I've spent a lot of time working on the National Committee on the Adoption of Ag Tech for Food Security, very long name in the UAE, but supporting governments for good policy and supporting customers to understand the differences in organic and not, quality and not, and help to discern, they call it BS that you have to deal with every day and people's poor product claims, which only confuse the market. And until there's a globally accepted standard, and until countries and governments and others regulate effectively, that creates a lot of noise and difficulty. Because fundamentally, if you make a better product and you can't have the consumer recognize that because there's too much mud in the air, um, that's difficult too. So we actually innovate on all three of those elements and they're all equally important. It's not just about tech. And that, the final thing on that, sorry to get on a soapbox here, too much, when a farm is talking about nothing but tech, 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 run. Because fundamentally they make food. So if they don't ever talk about food and the cost of the food they produce with all that tech, be worried. Because we aren't selling tech. My, nobody pays me for my technology. They buy our amazing fresh produce on the shelf with a certain you know, value proposition and price position and et cetera. So really we all need to recognize as an industry, we are farmers first. We characterize as ourselves as a technology enabled agribusiness. And that's what I think we all are. So some of these guys raising a lot of capital out there making tech uh, you know, I would love to see one turn a profit. I'm, I'm really hopeful that happens soon. I, I, I agree. The, uh, I, I couldn't agree more. There's a lot of noise and misinformation that distorts the market reality. Um, and, and I think what we're all talking about is the entire value chain. One can't just look at the technology or what you grow or the end user. You have to look at the entire value chain because it's only as strong as its weakest link. And along that entire value chain from the seed to the table, we have to figure out how do we enhance the product, how do we reduce the cost, how do we improve the quality, and how do we do that at a price that can potentially be profitable. And unless you can check that box and do this sustainably, you shouldn't waste your time or your money. Because like you, I've seen so many hundreds of millions of dollars thrown into high tech with no chance of ever being profitable. And I see good money going after bad money based on market hype rather than fundamental operating metrics, which is the best way to value a company. Alexander. Yeah, I, I just wanted to add a couple of thoughts here. You know, we do an annual census of CEA operators, controlled environment agriculture, which is greenhouses and vertical farms, which is what we're really talking about here. And you know, it's, a, it's a very exciting business. I'm excited about it. I've been doing it for 10 years. I couldn't be more excited about it, but it's extremely difficult to do. 78% of those that answered our survey said if they could go back in time, they would have chosen a different crop or different technology. So you really have to plan and prepare properly. The ability to make a profit in the sector is challenging. It's, it's not easy. It's difficult in agriculture in general. And proper planning prevents poor performance. So I just can't emphasize that enough, that you really need to think about your market. If you don't really have a technology problem. You obviously have a market and operations problem. So focus your energy in those areas. Uh, sustainability has been said a lot of times here, and I really want to be careful with this term because sustainability is not an end. It's an ongoing process of observation. It's not an A to Z or A to B journey. You have to make a goal, 
try to get to that goal, measure your impact, and then make another goal, and you go in a cycle of constant improvement. Now, our census last year looked at sustainability, and guess how many CA operators are actually measuring their water use, right? They're happy to say we're saving 70% or 90% less water, but almost 80% of them are not actually tracking their water across the use of irrigation and cleaning their facilities. So we have to be really careful as we promote this, especially to the next generation or to entrepreneurs or to investors or policymakers, because we're really kind of repeating the same mistakes as the past and we're actually not making ourselves any better than the conventional agricultural system that we're trying to optimize upon. So we have to be very careful when we say things like, food miles reduce carbon footprint. That is not true, right? If you build a vertical farm in New York City, your carbon footprint will be eight times higher by our estimates than a soil-based farm in California shipping to New York City. So we have to be really honest about the realities of these technologies and their performance because we have not only the supply chain issues, but the pandemic shows us that the supply chain is threatened and climate change is also getting worse. So we really have to develop these models in a way that's honest and resilient. I just want to share a few thoughts on that. I'm going to have Henry prepare my next pitch, pitch deck. You two looked at each other right away, especially when he said about water. Uh, yeah. Measurement of water. You both look at it and go, that's ridiculous. Why, why is that ridiculous? I just find that shocking. I'm, I'm a believer in you get what you measure. And if you don't measure it, yeah, you can't control it. And if you can't control it, you, have no, you don't have control of your process. And we're a manufacturing process in the end. So that actually shocks me. And it, it only feeds into this fear I have of veridical farming, right? I mean, these people making these claims that they've never measured. It just amazes me. And I think investors have a responsibility to take out the, the whip and fix this. Because they get what they measure. If they start measuring us and asking us to show me your data, show me your yield, show me your unit economics, et cetera, and this becomes the standard first question in accessing capital, the capital will go to the right people. But instead, there's been a lot of hype, and, as you mentioned. Yeah. And I, I fear, and I've, I've said this on a different stage once, but I fear this is like uh, clean tech 1.0 which set the world back 10 years and is probably responsible for 10% of the world's carbon footprint. Because these people, there was this hype cycle of people selling the promises of solar 20 years from now and this and that. Billions of dollars of venture capital particularly flowed into these capital intensive industries, which generally isn't a home for venture capital, like ours. And what happened though is that they all, the promises weren't real and a huge amount of that capital was written off and then everyone ran from the sector for 10 years. And it took a long time for wind power and solar power and coal gasification and all these technologies to recover because of the scars of the past and most of those investors lost their jobs. They lost billions of capital. So I don't want us to repeat that problem, that hype cycle that can set our industry back. So I think truth, truth tellers like Henry are important and I think also we have a responsibility as entrepreneurs and capital providers have a responsibility to police this. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll add to that by being clear. None of us have started in this or any other business with a plan A that succeeded. Not one of us. You learn, you grow, you will make mistakes in the development process, you'll choose the wrong technology, you can choose the wrong people, you can choose the wrong product mix. But you need to learn as you grow and then you need to pivot and take everything you learn and bring it forward and enhance the productivity of what you're doing. That's critically important. If we talk about the kind of farms that we grow in and we talk about vertical farms, I believe all of these farms have a place. I believe open field agriculture has a place. We all need to figure out how to grow food better. A vertical farm may not work in New York City and it may not work in San Francisco, but it could work in other land-starved markets where populations are high and you can have resources that work, or perhaps even government subsidies on energy, which is really what cripples them from a profitability point of view. But looking at all those inputs is critically important in evaluating your bill decision. Alexander, go first. Yeah, there's a great example for that, for example, in Kenya. Um, yesterday I was on a panel where we were speaking about, you know, ag tech in developing countries. And Kenya is a country that has um, a fairly strong agricultural sector, but one of the biggest issues they face in Kenya is a very weak infrastructure. So in Kenya, about 30 to 40 percent of all produce is lost just on the way from the farms to, you know, Nairobi and to, you know, or to Mombasa from where it gets shipped. And, and, and that's a case where vertical farming actually makes sense or urban farming actually makes sense, where you're eliminating that, trans that transport period that, you know, reduces your, your food wastage by about 40 percent. And so, like you said, you know, a vertical farm might not work in, in New York, but that doesn't mean that that technology is not, is not justifiable or, or valuable. I, I, know think, I know who has the data. Henry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, and so I think, you know, you, you asked if we're running the farms of the future. I think 
more than that, we are the farmers of the future, and agriculture is under severe attack. Um, uh, you know, especially for example, the meat industry numbers on um, greenhouse gas emissions in the meat industry are overstated regularly like crazy. Yeah, but is it going to take guys like you to be the farmers of the future that are finance, that you have finance background, you understand what the numbers are? Is that what it is? Because that doesn't seem like what a farmer would have been in the past at all. No, it, it's not. But I think it's, it's, I think we're an interesting gateway for younger people to join the sector. The average age of a farmer in, in North America and Europe is about 55 years old. Uh, be careful. Be careful. I'm, I'm Sorry, <laughs> which is a fantastic <laughs> age to be in. <laughs> yeah, but generally, I think you know we're we're opening you know a lot of people's eyes to agriculture again. We're making that industry more interesting, and our technology is going to be outdated over the next five, ten years, hopefully. Right, we want to make sure that we're always accessing and taking advantage of the best industry, uh, best technology in the market. But what we are setting is a, is a trend that hopefully a lot of people will follow into, and you know hopefully we enable a lot of these people to to enter the sector and rejuvenate the sector, and with that, you know, drive innovation, drive sustainability. I just wanted to comment on your, I, somebody asked me that once, and I asked, why do I keep seeing, you know, former bankers, private equity people getting in this business? I believe the answer is that these are very complex businesses, and they require a lot of capital, and we speak the language in gov of governance and capital and capital formation and capital structuring and debt, and, and that's all needed to fund these assets but then we have the passion and belief in it. But when we're most effective, and I'll, I'll stand by my grower, is when we partner with a real farmer. My, my farmer does not have a Stanford degree. He, he grew up in Holland, a multi-generational Dutch agronomist. What do you mean your he, farmer relationship? Uh, Jan, Jan Prins is my uh, head grower, and I would be nothing without him, right? I mean, he- Who's he, uh, in, in your- In Pure Harvest Barn Farms. Okay, he runs practices. all of our agronomists. He runs our agronomical practice, our relationship with all the knowledge out there. Seed suppliers have tons of knowledge. Um, there's uh, consultants, Wahanigan University and other universities, sure. and he's the bridge to that knowledge. And I've, you know, he's forgotten more about farming than I will ever know. And I, I think we're a powerful um, ally. I think when we, as entrepreneurs, are most effective is when we partner with those farmers, help them believe in this future and that we can grow these great businesses. And of course, they help us actually grow and deliver within the technologies we procure and build. To Sky's point, team building is as important as the structural building. Having a great farmer, having a great engineering and design team, having a great marketing team are all elements of that supply chain, the value chain that I alluded to earlier. And unless you have all that, someplace along the way you may hit a speed bump, which will require you to fix it and make it better. So planning, which is what people with an industry background and an investment background have, is fundamentally important for executing a plan that makes sense. So I had the opportunity, a good friend of mine, his name is Kerry Fowler. And Kerry, do you guys know who he is? Yeah. Of course he, you he know. The Seed Vault. Yeah, so he uh, is the one that raised the money from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to create the Seed Vault in Svalbard, which is uh, at the most northern island of the world. And uh, oh. basically he's storing all the world's seeds. And when you talk to Kerry, Kerry always says variety is what makes him sad, is how much of the world's variety of of crops have just disappeared, like apples. You know, we, there's almost 400 varieties of apples. There's basically eight that we use now, and that's it, right? And he's concerned as the money people get the farms, they're only going to go after the, pro, the, the, the crops that Absolutely. make money, which will hinder all the other varieties. What's your thought on that? I can say we're a living counterexample to that. I mean, we, we now grow 29 varieties in the UAE. Over half of them have never been witnessed in the Middle East. So we're actually inviting variety, bringing seeds from Belgium, Argentina, Sao Paulo, um, all over the world because they provide a dynamic taste and experience for the consumer. Now, yes, we do plant, for example, if I plant tomato on the vine, we'll plant six different varieties and then replant only the best one or two that perform well because that's also important. But we're actually inviting and bringing back variety. There are well over 400 commercial tomato varieties, and we've grown over 40 of them, and then tested what the market will accept. So it's, it's part of consumers adopting it too, though. Ultimately, customers are, are the gatekeeper to the consumer, meaning retailers, and then consumers need to buy to drag it through the customer, and that's a delicate dance. But as people understand this, and we get control of our cost structures, I think variety is actually going to be part of what makes us, you know, more successful. You were going to say I, I, Yeah, but I, I think what's going to happen in your case, because it happened in ours, is produce is a destination product of the retailer. It's what drives store traffic. More often than not, a consumer will go to the store to buy produce than any other thing, more than two, generally two, two and a half times a week. So when you can deliver a superior product that gives that retailer a higher margin, enables him to promote your product, 
he will reorder, he will reorder, he will reorder, you'll get multiple SKUs, and I'm sure you're living this dream right now. But all those dreams start out as nightmares because it's a daunting challenge to figure all of these things out and then execute it and make it happen. And once the consumer says, gee, I want those pure harvest delicious tomatoes, that's what stimulates your sale process, gives you more access to capital, and it's true for any business across the world. I get it. I get it. You were going to say something? Yeah, just a few thoughts on the challenge in the food system. You know, uh, there was this thing called the Green Revolution, right, where we sort of had this ability to create synthetic fertilizers and grow huge amounts in areas we couldn't before. And what that did is it centralized agriculture away from cities, right? We used to build our food systems where we lived because we needed to depend upon it. And technology allowed us to separate that. But that separation had a lot of consequences, right? We have all kinds of chemicals going into our food. We don't know where our food comes from. The lack of variety in the food has occurred because of that. What also happened is there's been a lot of consolidation of these farms to more monoculture situations. If you look at the data in the US, right, the scale of farms is going up and the number of farms has been going down. And young people, right, we're not raised, none of us are raised to say, hey, you should be a farmer. Right? You should be a lawyer, you should be an investor, you should be a doctor. And so we've created a culture where agriculture is not a viable livelihood. And what's really exciting about what everyone here is doing is they're creating this sort of new renaissance that agriculture can be high tech, it can be closer to the consumer, it can be cleaner, it can become more efficient, and that's a really exciting new time. And I guess I want to say some positive things as well because I've been a little bit negative Nancy today. But I think that's a really exciting moment to get into agriculture because now you can produce food in a lot of different ways, a lot of different places and create innovations around that exciting brands, exciting impacts on society, on economic development. And it's a really, really great time to get involved in the sector. But I also want to say that this discussion, the kind of honesty you're hearing here, especially related to greenhouse and vertical farming is very different to what you would hear 10 years ago or five years ago at events. And that also gives me hope because the dialogue is now advancing and becoming more mature as we talk about the nuance. And Sky, you mentioned the sort of hybridization. My next article coming out will be on the hybridization of agriculture. For example, vertical farming used to be promoted as a panacea, right? The, the future of farming, feeding the world no matter what the climate is. Well, now we're starting to see that vertical farming is being marketed and communicated as a complement to greenhouses, seedling production for them, or a complement to producing potato seeds so that you can optimize that. So it's becoming a complement to the food system as opposed to a replacement or some you know, single silver bullet, which is exactly what we need to talk about. We need to talk about when this works, why this works here, how much it costs, how much it will make, how sustainable it actually is, and embrace that nuance because that's when you get to find the winning middle ground where it can be really exciting and the win-win for the consumer, for the environment, and for the planet. I think we should end that right there. That's the, the perfect way to end this. Gentlemen, I want to thank you so much for being part of this. Sky, I need you to do me a favor. Our next panel, you actually know them. It's all around uh, growing, I, I'm just raising fish in the desert. Can you give them a little tease on why you're excited about this? Uh, certainly, in full disclosure, I'm an investor and advisor to the net company because one of the co-founders is a co-founder of Pure Harvest Smart Farms, Robert Koopsis. Yeah, I think he's here somewhere. Um, why am I excited? Because it's the same story. It's uh, what they're doing in recirculated aquaculture systems is fundamentally controlled environment ag. They're taking fish farming out of the oceans where there are many complexities and environmental issues, and most of which are actually even more public than the challenges in fruit and veg. And then they're bringing this into a controlled environment where they can treat the water, recirculate the water, it's more resource efficient, they can embed with renewable energies, they can do all of the same things we're doing to grow fish more efficiently, more effectively, very healthy, incredibly tasting, and also what's unique about fish, and I think this is a really compelling thing about the business case, but also the environmental case, and it, the first time Robert told me this, it opened my eyes, is he's like, look, when you fly a fresh fish, you cut it up and 52% of it goes in the garbage, right? You don't do that with a tomato. And it shocked me because I'm like, wow, that's even more compelling in terms of the transportation arbitrage argument. And obviously fresh fish is better than frozen, though lots of people eat frozen, there's nothing wrong with that. But if you wanna drive people eating more fish, it's a, it's a healthier uh, for humans and for health outcomes and et cetera and longevity. And it's healthier for the planet than say cows, which we know are pretty destructive, right? It's a huge problem, even though my prior technology business enables cows. Um, but the, but it's, it's a huge thing. So I think what's great about it is it sits in a lot of themes toward health outcomes and better uh, health and longevity for humans if they eat more fish. It makes it more economic, more sustainable, and all the same investment themes and the power of 
what has been a powerful 20-year adoption cycle in controlled environment agriculture. In my view, this is just an added element of controlled environment ag. It just is fish farming, not fruit and veg farming. So I think it's a great story, and it's one that's newer, and it's pretty exciting. Ask them what happens to these salmon, and what do they live like? It's, it's fascinating technology. And we'll find out next in about a minute from now, so stay tuned to that. But again, thank you, gentlemen, and I really appreciate thank you being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.